fine then? Uh, is it going to be broadcast? I don't see the I thing. think it's on YouTube, isn't it? Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, did you want to kick anything off or we just want to... I, we'll start with John Davis, City Traffic Sounds Engineer. good. We've got one agenda item. It's uh, Vision Zero. So, John, let's jump right in. Good morning, members of Council and Honorable Mayor. Uh, my name is John Davis, uh, City Traffic Engineer. And this morning we're going to discuss with you the Vision Zero traffic safety uh, plan effort that we are uh, undertaking. Uh, today with us we have our consultant team, uh, Sarah Abel from Tool Design Group, and then Chris uh, Spire, Shears, Shires from uh, Confluence. Uh, and uh, at this time, I'll uh, bring up uh, Sarah, and she will be facilitating the uh, discussion. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. It's so great to be in Des Moines, Iowa. As a Midwesterner myself, it's so good to come back to the Midwest. I'm actually based in Washington, D.C. with Tool Design Group. This morning, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to some concepts um, related to Vision Zero um, as we launch this effort in the city of Des Moines. And then this is really a listening session throughout all of our activities today, especially with you all as council and then through the rest of the day with other bodies in the city and the public. Um, so really most of this time this morning will be to hear from you challenges, ideas that the council has that you've heard from your constituents. Um, with regards to improving transportation safety across Des Moines. So we're excited that the city is undertaking this Vision Zero Transportation Safety Plan um, and are happy to be a part of it as we've done um, Vision Zero plans all over the country in various sized cities. So it's a pleasure to be working with you all. So the goal of the listening session today, as I mentioned, is to, to listen to challenges and ideas about improving transportation safety <laughs> across Des Moines. Uh, we are very much so in the listening and gathering phase of this project to make sure that we get a plan that is right for the Des Moines community. Um, we're going to be meeting with the City Council, the Transportation Safety Committee, um, City staff, and the community today in a robust day of community engagement. So what is Vision Zero? Vision Zero is pretty simple. It's a goal of zero traffic deaths and serious injuries on our streets and setting a goal target year to achieve those zero traffic deaths. Um, the safe system approach is how we get there. Those are the methodologies and the ways in which we go about getting there. Um, shared responsibility at all levels. This includes safety culture, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then some elements and principles of the safe system approach, which I'll talk about in a minute. So everyone involved in transportation decisions, from you all on uh, city council, to maintenance and operation staff that are repaving streets or even miss utilities companies that are digging up the right of way, have a shared responsibility to ensure the street system does not have a serious or fatal outcome. This is from the International Vision Zero Challenge. So what is the safe system approach? This has worked effectively um, in other countries, including Sweden and the Netherlands, which you may have heard about in your research as you all undertake Vision Zero here. Um, but it's really a systemic shift from what you're doing now to what you can be doing to prioritizing safety in every decision that you make with the safety as the top priority. So it's focused on eliminating fatal and serious injuries, which you'll hear me say a lot throughout the day today. But the safe system principles are that death and serious injury should not be accepted on our roadways. Uh, humans do make mistakes, but those mistakes should not result in a fatal crash. So we need to design a system based on human vulnerability with a risk to fatality um, based on crash. And we need to design for those most vulnerable road users and a vulnerable road user is those that are outside of a car, not protected by a metal box. Um, it's shared responsibility, which I talked about earlier, and that safety is proactive. We shouldn't just be doing hotspot analysis where the crashes are occurring, but we should be looking at similar contexts where the crashes could be occurring and making those system-wide changes to improve safety on streets in Des Moines. And then redundancy is critical. As I mentioned, if a mistake does occur, our roadway should be designed 
so that if someone veers off the road, they're not going to hit a pedestrian or cyclist. Um, so that redundancy is important. Signal timing, turn hardening, that layering is important. Um, and we have to be thinking about the safe system wheel um, like a whole wheel. You can't have just one piece of this wheel and still have it function. So thinking about all five elements in every decision that we're making, safe roads, safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, and post-crash care. So the safe system approach framework, I know I just presented the principles and elements, but the safe system framework, in my opinion, is where the rubber really meets the road, no pun intended, for how to really do um, safety as a top priority in designing streets. So anticipating human error, so separating users in space and time, and increasing attentiveness and awareness, so that again, if a crash does occur, it does not result in a fatality, so proactive versus reactive, uh, um, uh, and then also um, that redundancy element that we talked about earlier. Also, accommodating human injury tolerances. I don't know if you have all have seen uh, AAA, um, about a decade ago, did a study of the risk of pedestrian fatality um, uh, based on speeds. And we know that there are certain speeds at which a vulnerable road user, such as pedestrian, is at risk for serious and fatal injury. So we should be designing speeds and impact forces. Impact forces are such as turning vehicles, um, where they may not be speeding, but where the speed of the vehicle impacts um, uh, the potential for a fatal or serious injury and in the event of crash. So reducing speeds, reducing impact forces. This is an example of a separated um, bike facility um, and sidewalk improvement project that we did in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, um, where you can see how we go about separating users in space and time so that if a crash does occur, such as a roadway departure crash, it is less likely to occur in a, uh, it was less likely to result in a fatality. So you can see the separation in time with the bike signal. Um, you can see the separation in space, the amount that the cycle track is pulled away from the road. The landscaping barriers create a physical vertical separation um, from the travel vehicle lanes to, to the um, uh, pedestrian and bicycle zone. So another element of this is creating a positive safety culture across Des Moines at all levels. And it really is an internal shift by the city government to make sure that safety is the top priority in every decision that you're making regarding transportation. And then impacting those external behaviors that we may not always be able to design for on our roadways that we need to change the behavior. So examples of this are um, seat belt uh, uh, wearing campaigns that have been occurring since the 1970s. We've seen that seat belt um, uh, use has gone up since those campaigns uh, nationally. So that's a good example of traffic safety culture. Um, eliminating distracted driving. We know that everybody has smartphones. Most people have smartphones this day and age, and it's become a, a very common problem on our roadways of distracted driving. Obeying speed limits, um, impaired driving are good examples of we cannot always design the roadway um, to prevent those behaviors from occurring. Um, speeding is one that we can do both, but awareness campaigns to change those behaviors on our roadways are critical to vision zero um, in communities. So I'm gonna play a short video for you that explains safety culture um, better than I can um, and is more entertaining than I am. So we'll go ahead and play that for you. What would it be like if leaders, organizations, and people across our communities shared a strong, positive traffic safety culture? Traffic safety is important to all of us, but can we do more? How many fatalities and serious injuries are acceptable? Think about it. Most of us agree that the only acceptable answer is zero. However, right now in our country, we are far from zero. In 2017, over 37,000 people were killed in motor vehicle crashes on our roads. And the costs are tremendous. The estimated annual economic and social cost of crashes is more than $835 billion. Getting to zero will not be easy. 
It will require us to explore new innovative ways to improve traffic safety. It will require us to work together. This might look like everyone wearing a seatbelt, drivers fully engaged in the driving task, and people obeying speed limits and taking extra care around pedestrians and bicyclists. Getting to zero will require more than just focusing on drivers. It could include families talking about traffic safety and creating family rules. Schools would be promoting traffic safety in health classes and driver education programs. Workplaces would be establishing policies and providing training to eliminate crashes. Community leaders could advocate for and pass appropriate laws to reduce risky driving behaviors and make sure programs are used with those who violate the laws so that it doesn't happen again. Professionals from local, state, tribal, and federal traffic safety agencies can take the lead to promote growing a positive traffic safety culture. These leaders can help communities form and sustain effective coalitions and partnerships to support the goal of zero fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. These agencies can provide tools and resources to communities, workplaces, and families to help them create a positive traffic safety culture. They can invest in developing innovative new strategies. Our first step is to develop shared language and understanding about traffic safety culture, as well as ways for growing it. So we cut this off because it's part of a much larger project actually um, under the FHWA pool fund study on traffic safety culture. So we just played the relevant portions for you all. What would it be like if leaders... Morning. Give me one second. I'm going to click this manually so it doesn't play again. There we go. So that is a good overview of the landscape of transportation safety at Vision Zero um, internationally and across the United States. And now I want to talk a little bit more about what's been happening in Des Moines as we start this project for you all. Um, so you all have been tracking uh, um, transportation safety under your complete streets data dashboard for a few years now. Um, and uh, based on the 2021 um, draft data that's been developed by city staff, we've seen that there are fatalities and serious injuries occurring on roadways in Des Moines. Um, and you can see the breakdown by mode of fatal and serious injuries. You have a much larger dashboard on transportation safety under the Complete Streets program, but we wanted to focus in on the fatal and serious injuries um, uh, with our initial work um, here, and so wanted to present a snapshot of data to, to you of those fatal and serious injuries by mode. Um, we will be doing more complex safety analyses uh, as we get deeper into this project. It will include uh, what is called high injury network mapping. So we'll map the locations of these crashes, look at crash causation, look at the roadway context, um, and, and apply that to similar conditions across your roadway network across the city of Des Moines. Um, regardless of who owns the right of way, we typically do high injury network mapping on all roadways within a city and not just those that are locally owned. We want to understand the full picture of the problems and where right of ways um, uh, uh, owned by two different entities connect. Oftentimes we do see a lot of crashes where a state DOT connects to a local road. Um, so we'll be doing full analysis, both proactive and, and high injury network mapping. Um, but this is what you looked, um, what fatalities and serious injuries looked like in Des Moines last year. So we do have important work to do here. Um, I apologize, the bottom band is cutting this off slightly, but uh, vehicle, um, fatal and serious injury crashes were um, highest in Des Moines, um, and then uh, serious injury or serious injuries. Uh, the second highest category was motorcycles, um, pedestrians followed by bicyclists, um, and then fatalities. You had ten vehicle uh, on vehicle fatality crashes, and then three pedestrian crashes last year in the city of Des Moines. Um, so what were the leading uh, causes of most of all crashes in the city of Des Moines? So the previous slide was fatal and serious injury. This is an analysis of all major crashes. Um, what were those leading causes? Um, so following too close was your top um, indication by police for um, all crashes in the city of Des Moines, followed by operating vehicle in reckless manner, followed by ran traffic signal, um, so red light running, followed by loss control, followed by uh, failure to yield when making a left turn. 
Um, so those are your top causes of all crashes last year in the city of Des Moines. You can see um, the, the full analysis on the, um, on the bar graph. Wouldn't those all be excessive speed, though? You're following someone too close. It's likely a factor, um, but I think it's more the right, the three second rule we learn in driver's sure. ed. Um, you may be at the same pace or at the speed limit, but still following too close. So we call that pace versus speeding, but it could also be speeding as well. Um, the, um, uh, the lost control in the operating vehicle in a reckless manner could be speed. Um, and I will say that probably this analysis included multiple check marks based on probably your minimum crash reporting form but I have not taken a look at the minimum crash reporting form yet that's required in Iowa um, for the police to complete. Okay, so next steps more broadly. Um, as I mentioned, at this point, we are in the listening and learning and getting to know Des Moines transportation safety phase. Um, so we'll be doing additional community workshops in mid-September. You'll be hearing from us shortly on those. Um, We'll be doing community pop-up events to both promote those workshops as well as gather more input from the community. We'll be doing a um, community survey here in the next couple of months. We're standing up a Vision Zero Transportation Safety Working Group that will guide our work on the development of this plan and will hopefully also remain a body within, um, within the city to ensure implementation of the plan. Um, and we'll be conducting staff interviews, including a lunch with some staff today. And recently, the staff um, uh, up, uh, um, launched a Vision Zero webpage on the city's website. So that will be where we will um, communicate to the public and keep um, uh, presentations and draft plans and initial goals and actions available for the public. That's where we'll promote those community workshops, we'll distribute um, the community survey, um, and really that'll be your page for transportation safety um, in Des Moines. Um, I should mention the next step after this is really to draft those initial goals and actions. Um, before we write the entirety of the plan, we'll be, which will be a um, how did we get to these goals and actions, as well as what do you do next with performance measures, countermeasure toolkits, stuff like that. Um, we really want to hone in on these goals and actions and develop those with you all, with the city staff, with the public to make sure we get those right. So that once we develop those, um, those metrics for implementing those actions, they are clear and measurable. Um, so that you guys can carry those forward once we're done with the plan. So with that, we really want to hear from you all on council today. We've got kind of four big picture questions we'd like to ask you all and get feedback um, as we start to think about the next steps of this project with your goals and actions. We want to make sure that we document as much as possible with regards to the challenges and the issues that you all have seen in Des Moines, um, and, and really ideas, start to generate those ideas for changing the way the system looks and changing the way we make decisions so that safety is the top priority when we're making transportation decisions. So our thought is that we will take about 10 minutes per, um, per bullet to have a discussion. Um, we appreciate the council. I just want to thank you all for setting aside this entirety of the work session for Vision Zero. Um, appreciate um, the time you're, you're spending on this um, to start and looking forward to the discussion. So I'll help facilitate, but we really want to hear from you. If we um, veer from these four questions, I would like to get through these four questions. Um, but if we have other discussions, that is great as well. We're really here to listen. So. Um, I'll turn it back over to you all and, um, and yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, that's the remainder of the hour. I mean, I, I, I'll start with the, the question number one, and I think I said it before, would be speed. I mean, that's the number one challenges, concerns, safety issues that we hear from residents each and every time that we get emails. Um, you know, people are racing up and down my street. 
you know that's that's what I hear the most um, you know part of part of my ward doesn't have a lot of sidewalks um, so um, that's also a challenge um, but I would say probably those two would be the the top transportation safety issue that, that I hear okay for me, the transportation issues that I hear more than anything is speeding. We've got, you know, we've got some drag racing going on on Friday nights and Saturday nights, and I keep hearing from uh, I keep hearing from officials. Well, they've been doing it since the 1960s. I don't care if they've been doing it since the 1960s, guys. It's time to get it stopped. And, and we can't depend on our police to do that. We've, they're busy taking care of high priority issues. So we've got to figure out a way that we can get, get a handle on the all speeders in our city in a way, whether it's you know, traffic calming measures. I think we should be focusing on our four lane corridors. You know, we've got highways that are going right through our city. We know that people are speeding up and down. We just had a fatality um, there. I think we should be focusing on that. I know we're doing some traffic calming um, in a certain area, my ward, and I, you know, social media is blowing up because people don't want us to take away their four lanes. But we've got to. I, I just think for the safety of our residents, we have to do that. We should be focusing on school zones, expanding those school zones. And thank you, Steve. I know tonight there's a, a pretty good piece about, about doing that. And we appreciate that. But we have a lot of private schools in our city. We should be focusing on all schools in our city, not just the public schools. We need to be doing everything we can to expand that, to keep our residents safe that are walking, we know that children's brains are not developed enough to gauge how far away a car is. Um, there's studies out there, I'm sure you've seen them, you know that. So we've got to keep them safe. Linda uh, touched on a challenging topic and that's our, our um, federal and state highways that uh, roll through our city and if there are changes that we want to make and let's just say adding a hawk light to get those the, the layers of approvals to to do so <coughs> is challenging if you can help us with what other cities have done um, to to cut some of the um, uh, time to make changes, to make our streets safer, I think we'll all be appreciative of those tactics. Um, also, you, you've, you've probably learned talking with others that we have a pretty extensive trail network. Um, our on-street bike accommodations are pretty choppy and uh, there's not a, a lot of continuous um, corridors for, for biking to jobs and, and shopping areas and, and to libraries and such. So, so we would appreciate help and strategy on that. Um, I, I don't know if Connie Bozen is on the, on the call or not, but um, uh, as an, as an at-large council member, uh, the, the speed is always the, the biggest issue that we hear from the residents, so. Um, I, I, I personally will be interested in how, what you've learned working with other cities in how to market these changes, because it, this will be a sea change. Like, I know that um, in some cities, the speed limit in school zones is, has been reduced to, um, uh, 10 or 15 miles an hour, and that's a big change for us to market that. And, and I think we will need some help in in making those changes. Or uh, let's see, you did the 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 Vision Zero plan for 
for Minneapolis and St. Paul? Yeah, for both? we did Minneapolis, not St. Paul. Okay, well, I, I've seen a lot of uh, 20 is plenty signs on the street there, so it's one thing to put the signs up, but, but how do we get people to change their behavior, so. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I mean, I'll agree with a lot of what is what has been said. I, you know, one of the things we've we've started a traffic calming program for residential streets, and I get a ton of requests for for that program uh, where folks have concern that again, that's the the speeding. I think that's at least a piece of what everyone has mentioned is it, the speeding happens everywhere, but we get a lot of requests on the, the residential streets, and I think Carl was maybe alluding to a solution there beyond our, just our traffic calming. Um, I, I will agree with Council Member Westergaard. I get complaints about, uh, you know, there is a racing culture, a drag racing. Uh, I represent the downtown area, so I get a lot of scooping the loop and drag racing questions, but it's it's also expanded elsewhere. One of the things that I don't think anyone has mentioned that is a part of that and that I think also extends to issues we have on the corridors, the folks who live downtown when there's racing or even just speeding, one of the challenges is they don't feel safe crossing the street. Uh, and I think we have that on, on other corridors where you know, I'll give Grand Ave Avenue as an example, right? That's a major corridor. Uh, right now it's four <laughs> lanes. Uh, it, it's a block away from a pretty major sort of retail area with, with Ingersoll. I mean, Grand Avenue doesn't have that, that retail piece, uh, but it's sort of the street that's in between a lot of the, a chunk of the residential in that, that retail. And and I think the connectivity between the two is, is an issue and the ability for folks to feel safe crossing. Uh, I think that comes up with some, some regularity and I think that's a common denominator on, on other corridors. Uh, so another corridor that I get a lot of issues about, um, Southwest 9th, particularly Southwest 9th right out of, uh, right out of downtown. Um, partly because of some of the uses there. We've just made major improvements to McRae Park. And a piece of the feedback that I got from neighbors is, well, you've made these major improvements, but we can't really walk there, right? We can't, we can't get there because, because the, the corridor that's a separation between the two really feels like a barrier. And then you go just a little farther south, and you're at Lincoln High School um, in Park. Park Elementary, I mean, you've got schools right on that corridor as well, uh, and major safety concerns. So that's sort of illustrative of some of the corridor issues, but that particular area has been, I think, a flagged area that we haven't had a comprehensive solution in that area. Uh, and I think all of the issues that we're talking about, right, from speed to to the ability to have safe crossings are, are present right there. Um, and then there's sort of a, a road design on our four lanes. Uh, it, it's almost kind of that racing culture, but not, not the deliberate drag racing, but people who will sort of bob in and out, weave in and out. So there might be that, that person who's going 25 or 30 on the corridor and being maybe driving at an appropriate and safe speed and then there's the person who's impatient with that and zipping through at 40 until they get to the next person who they can't necessarily go around. Uh, and I think we see a lot of that on our, on our corridors where the majority of folks might be driving at a safe speed, but because of the road design, you have, you have the, the folks who are outliers who can, can have a much greater impact. So those are, those are pieces of, of the, the things that I'm hearing, I think consistent with, with what others are hearing. So also related to speed, um, uh, our 
legislature has not really embraced uh, speed cameras. What, did I state that fairly well? <laughs> well, I, I, I would say, that, I mean, we've got them now, so let's not be critical <laughs> while we still have them. <laughs> well, so, so there are cities that have many more speed cameras than we do. And I know that Chicago recently, well, let's see. In Des Moines, we, we don't issue tickets until they're um, 11 miles over the speed limit. So effectively, you can go 36 miles an hour, or you can go 35 miles an hour in a 25 zone without being ticketed. So yet other cities have figured out a way to issue those tickets for starting at six miles over the speed limit. So Joe, Joe uh, Joe's going to. No, I, I, I mean, I, I would agree with you, but I, I think if we do anything to uh, disrupt how we are uh, using the speed cameras at this point through the state state government, uh, we might not have the ability to have that tool in our toolbox to set up the mobile speed cameras in our neighborhoods and things like that. Uh, I know it's very frustrating, probably for all of us, but. Uh, I, I don't even think that that's an option, and I wouldn't even consider that option at this point. Well, We're not going to have any tools in our toolbox. Well, uh, well, well I, I would be interested in learning what strategies have worked in other c cities. <laughs> and so in some cities, like I've noticed that uh, instead of the um, speeding tickets going to the, um, or the speeding ticket revenue going to the city, it goes for like a neighborhood park or other improvements that the um, city does. So I would be, be interested in l learning strategies that do work elsewhere. Yeah, automated uh, traffic safety cameras are a hot button issue in many communities. And if I could just give a little bit of context, I wanna try not to respond to every one of your ideas or challenges because I'm here to listen. I wanna get as much out of you all today. Um, but I will highlight that a, an action of your action plan could be to work with the state legislator on X, Y, Z. Um, so, um, and hopefully uh, everyone is brought into the fold of this effort. I know that um, we've been talking about Iowa DOT being on the working group, um, having insurance companies, since you have so many insurance companies here in Des Moines, which is really unique. It'll actually be the first chance I'll be working directly with insurance companies on Vision Zero. So really bringing everybody into this. Um, Austin, uh, Texas, their Vision Zero effort included um, an action of uh, advocating for speed safety cameras at the state legislature. In Texas, they were not allowed, so you could have an action like that. Um, so, right, you can't put actions on things that you don't have the ability to change, but you can set a broader policy action um, with regards to the city's advocacy work at the state level um, could be a way to go about doing that, and that's what Austin did. They set some larger state um, legislature actions that they wanted to advocate for in their Vision Zero plan. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll add, I mean, I, I agree with Carl that, that I think we should be looking at those best practices, and uh, you know, we do have a challenging legislative environment for that, so I think, you know, ultimately that's one of the things that the seven of us will have to decide how we fit that in. But I want the information to make a good decision in terms of what does the best practice look like, what would the data support, and, and those are the type of things that would allow us to make a case, even if we might not be able to get the state law changed, having some of that foundational information uh, An approach, I think, is really critical. Uh, you know, folks might not listen, but but I think part of our job <laughs> is to make the case for what we can do to make things as safe as possible, and how we can best use tools that we know work elsewhere. So, in, in other communities where they've adopted this uh, Vision Zero, um, is it does the insurance does your insurance go down? Um, 
in in your community as a resident of of that community will your car insurance go down in those in those communities have the, have you seen that through the insurance yeah program? i mean at times i'll use the example of carmel indiana well they don't have a vision zero a uh, um, dedicated vision zero program the mayor and council has been very dedicated to systemic implementation of roundabouts in that community and they have very heavily focused on the insurance premium costs and measuring that. I don't think we measure the economic impacts of transportation safety enough in the work that we do. Um, but Carmel, Indiana is a really good example where they have tracked insurance rates. Um, and I think that would be a unique opportunity in Des Moines because you are kind of known as headquarters for um, uh, so many insurance companies. And we had the pleasure of talking to the city manager and assistant city manager in, in advance of this meeting and that we discussed that. Do we, do we utilize the insurance companies that are based in Des Moines and really lean in? Um, Columbus, Ohio also has a lot of insurance companies and they have partnered for some public awareness campaigns, but not necessarily what I would call the economic impact of transportation safety. You saw in the video that there are economic studies on the cost of crashes, right? The goal of insurance companies are, are to not pay out, right? Um, uh, so um, yeah, I think it's a unique thing to explore in the city of Des Moines, given um, some of the businesses that you have here. Um, but I would point you to Carmel, Indiana is a good example where they've done roundabouts at, at um, high injury intersections. They rolled it out Right. If you have one roundabout, people may be confused on how to operate within that roundabout. But if you have 10, the behavior changes. A lot of the traffic calming and countermeasures and roadway designs, I actually think that systemically putting them in um, at multiple locations versus one to start is how you change behavior more permanently. Um, and a roundabout and the roundabouts in Carmel, Indiana are a good example of that. They didn't just do one, they did them across the entire road network where they were needed, and people know how to operate within roundabouts. Uh, so Carmel, Indiana, yeah. population 100,000, 140 roundabouts. I think we're just about to put in our first roundabout in our city. So speaking, speaking of that, uh, I, I actually had a resident request for a roundabout this, uh, this weekend. Uh, in an area that I think has been talked about for roundabout, but it's uh, it's on Grand Avenue. It's that 31st Street intersection, which is an offset intersection that that is, I think, partly kind of dangerous because of the offset, and people get confused by that. But I think Grand Avenue, to your point on implementing it, something like that in multiple places, I, I think Grand Avenue, you could probably replace a number, if not all of the signalized intersections between downtown and, and 42nd or even farther with roundabouts effectively uh, and, uh, and, and get that change. It might actually help with traffic flow uh, at the same time you're, you're slowing things down and, and getting rid of those left-hand turn dangers, uh, getting rid of the the potential for intersection crashes. So I'm very curious about, about that and thinking about where that would fit and where you could try sort of a series of, of roundabouts at once, because I do think there's benefit. Yeah, and this project will explore countermeasures that you can have in your toolbox. And it'll be interesting in this listening phase, we'll be, um, we will be looking at what we're hearing from you all in the community as like high injury where you feel unsafe along corridors and it'll be interesting we'll be mapping that and over the crashes and then the similar the conditions so it'll be interesting to see at this juncture what that looks like and then we'll also be providing a countermeasure toolbox of the things that could work in des moines but just know that this takes time i would encourage <laughs> you to look at those opportunities for systemic changes versus baby stepping towards the answer of safety um as you're um, as you're um, developing this plan and then starting to implement it um, after this, this uh, plan is written. Um, I'm gonna shift gears because I wanna make sure we have time again for all four questions, but the conversation can wander. Um, before I switch gears on the first question officially, is there anyone on the phone? Um, any council members on the phone that- The mayor's on the phone. The mayor's phone. on the phone as well, yeah.
Okay, hearing none, I'll jump to the next question, but feel free to jump in at any point. I don't want to forget about those that are on the phone, especially not the mayor. Um, so what do you think would be a reasonable goal year to achieve um, zero traffic deaths in Des Moines? This is a tricky question. Um, I will preface this by saying that most Vision Zero cities that started early on, I think were too aggressive with their goal years and they couldn't achieve it, which is why Vision Zero has gone through a bit of a criticism over the last couple of years that all these cities have committed to this, but none of them have achieved it. So I want to make sure that I stress the word reasonable. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure that if you all set a target year, which we recommend, um, so that you can measure towards that, what do you think that year would be and why? So no one, I mean, uh, city our size, you, you have, you've had these for years doing this, and they've set a goal, and they, they haven't achieved that goal? Most cities haven't. Um, two that I'll point to that I would say are kind of best practices or models would be Boulder, Colorado. Um, they have done a lot systemically and wholly, not baby stepping um, towards it, but they've made whole system changes. Um, and they've had um, two years of no traffic deaths. Um, uh, another uh, example that I'll use is actually Hoboken, New Jersey, has now had four years of zero traffic deaths in a row. Um, again, because they made pretty big changes to the way in which they were, dry, um, they were designing roads, um, and they didn't turn back. They really tried to change their policies and their practices and their guidance, and then start to implement those on the roads there wasn't a combination so those would be two i would forgive me how, how big are those communities oh i don't know populations off the top of my head i apologize all right i would i would have no idea how to set a goal for this i think it's going to be very difficult to achieve it uh, no matter what we do you you had that in there i mean people make mistakes and unfortunately it costs people lives and you know, I, I I would like to make some changes on the roadways, obviously, to make it safer. But uh, unfortunately, this thing right here probably the biggest distraction that we've got in our cars and, and everywhere else. And um, you know, until until that's no longer around, which I don't see that happening, um, we're gonna we're gonna struggle. We're gonna struggle to get zero deaths. Now it'd be great to eliminate it to whatever we can and do the best we can. And I think that we're on a road of doing that right now. But to set a date or a year that, uh, that we think we can achieve, and I, I'll tell you, that's no idea how to even come up with that date. My, my thoughts on it is our goal should, starting right now, our goal should be no traffic deaths but i look at this just like our plans and we have a whole lot of plans out there neighborhood plans traffic plans all these plans and i always tell people when i go to meetings it's a plan it's a goal it's out there that you know we're not going to achieve it in year one but we're always going to work toward that goal we know with some things that we're working on right now today, we've been in conversations with engineering and they're saying minimum two years before we can get this done. And we're saying, no, no, no. We as a council have directed them to say, no, we need to get this done sooner rather than later. But where does the money come from? You know, so, so it's gonna take some planning on, on council's part, we need to, we may have to eliminate something else in order to get these plans, but I think safety is, should always be our number one goal. And so, you know, I, I think if we set a goal for four years or five years, but working toward every day reducing those things, because it's going to take a lot of money. You know, if we're going to put roundabouts, the master plan for uh, South, for East 14, how many do they have? I think they have five or six or seven roundabouts as a way to, to reduce traffic, which I think is good. 
But man, are they going to get some resistance from the neighborhoods? You know, every time I go to a neighborhood meeting, it's like, we don't want those, we don't want those roundabouts in our neighborhood. And DOT said, we don't have funding for this yet. I think, I think they started on the south edge of Des Moines and they're up to Hartford. Are, are they that far, Steve? Or they're not very far along, you know. I mean, and this is DOT and we know it's going to be a, probably a 20 year plan before they hit it all through, through town. So, I, you know, I, I just don't know that it's even reasonable to, to put a year on it because it's dependent on, on so many things. Well, yeah, but you got to have a goal. Okay. So, yeah. Well, so, then let's but, set up our yeah. goal should be next year we don't win any. Well. I mean, that's our goal, <laughs> but when but, I go to neighborhood meetings, I don't say, you know, our goal is to have but, zero traffic deaths. But if we have to put a date on it, then I would go out five years. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between an aspiration and a goal, right? I mean, I think we all aspire to have zero traffic okay. deaths immediately. The goal is going to be what what we work towards, and uh, I it, it it would be helpful for me to have some benchmarks from from other communities in terms of what they've done and what they've achieved. I, I also have a question about. <laughs> Is this the type of thing that there can, I like the idea of either tiered goals or multiple sort of benchmarks, um, because I think there are things that we can control and that we can make big systemic changes to, you know, the way we design our roads, the speed limits, some of the things that we can control, we know will have an impact, but we also know they won't get us all the way there. Right, because to, to Joe's point or Councilmember Gatto's point, there's a cultural element, whether it be the distracted driving or, or the way people who want to race around town, like we've got to work on changing the culture as well. And I think that's sort of another level above and beyond, uh, above and beyond some of, some of the, the pieces that are still going to be difficult, but that we can directly control. Um, and so my take would be to, and I don't know, you know, I don't know our exact data, right? You showed us 13 traffic fatalities from, from last year. I, I mean, I think minimally, you know, by the end of this decade, we should have a goal to have that or even more. And then, you know, the next step is, I, and maybe it should be quicker than that. And, you know, the next step is to, to get to zero after that. And, and so I'd like to see kind of a, that tiered approach or a benchmarked approach where we have multiple goals that we are accountable to and that some of which are very much achievable in the near term. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head between the multiple goals and then the performance measures and doing interim reporting, right? The reason why we recommend, and even the federal government now under the Safe Streets and Roads for All new grant program that came out, um, where you have to meet a model plan in order to pursue funding under that new federal source. One of the requirements of the plans is to have a um, goal of zero traffic deaths by a certain year um, that has to be adopted by a appointed or elected body within the city um, uh, or MPO government. Um, but yeah, benchmarking towards it, right? I think you want to measure, okay, do we need to be doing more because deaths are going up or down? Um, right, and if it's just achieve a goal of zero traffic deaths, you can't really benchmark towards it. So I would encourage that all the actions and goals within this plan be benchmarkable and be measurable more than anything, and then and then stepping towards that ultimate goal. So thank you for that. So you might just speak a, just a, uh, um, a, a quick overview of the importance of of the city of Des Moines doing this Vision Zero plan now, getting it created, it, it will unlock f federal transportation dollars for the community. So I, I assume you have a goal for completing this study, your work, and that is? By which time frame? Yeah. 
Um, our scope is to um, have a plan to you all by the end of this year. Okay. And then that will put us in the, the next round of dollars that the um, transportation if, if you're um, asking about the Safe Streets and Roads for All program, which is the new federal funding under the bipartisan infrastructure <laughs> law, that is correct. So applications for this round are currently due September 15th, um, so it would be the next cycle. And if you have a plan that is compliant with their plan um, requirements for eligibility uh, next year or in future years, the city of Des Moines could go for implementation. Funding. Yeah, so let's do what we need to for to be compliant, and if that's two decades out, 20 years, um, if that meets the standard, that would be terrific. But um, if it's tighter than that, uh, keep us informed, so. Great, any other comments or thoughts or ideas on a goal year? I wanna make sure I give everybody a chance. Go 20 well, years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if that's a re if that meets the expectations of what what other communities are doing and the uh, compliance for a plan to unlock the federal dollars, that would be great. But so the federal government does not recommend a, a by a certain year or within so many decades. Okay. It's really up to the individual community. It's about what you feel you can achieve and measure against. Well, I guess a question I would have: you give two examples, right? You gave Boulder that, that was down to zero, and you gave Hoboken. Um, was, that, was that right? Was yes. it Hoboken? Um, so what was the time between their goal and achieving that, and where, where were they starting, right? I mean, if they were starting at five or six traffic fatalities a year, and got to, to zero, that, that's different. I mean, we're starting at, at 13, which is not, not huge, but not, not nothing. And, and I think the hardest piece for us, because I, I mean, it's top of mind, we've had a lot of motorcycle crashes in the last three weeks. Our, our police even put out a a, you know, a press release about it, and a lot of that it sounded like was driver behavior, and it was the cultural piece, even if we change some of these things. Like, those I know are going to be the hardest, hardest accidents and fatalities to impact. But I guess to me, I'm, I'm all for aggressive goals. Like, I like the idea of even 2030 or 2035, but I don't have. I don't feel like I have enough information to make a, a particularly informed, informed recommendation right now. Yeah, and there will definitely be more discussions on this, and we can provide more background in that information you requested. Um, this was meant to be have a discussion of, have you thought about this um, in the Vision Zero work that the city is launching? So yeah, there will be more chance to decide this um, throughout the process. Okay, I'm going to jump to the next question. What are some goals and actions you would like to see in the Vision Zero Transportation Safety Plan for Des Moines? We talked about this a little bit. I liked the visioning um, from Councilmember uh, Mendelbaum and some of the ideas and research that, that the rest of you have done, including Councilmember Voss. Um, so um, what, are some, what are some things we can be doing and changing? um in order to uh improve safety in des moines we talked about the challenges the issues the um the potential goal years and how you want to communicate this to the public as we make these changes but what are some specific goals and actions you want to set for yourselves in des moines S slower s school zones and uh, you know i think uh for our high schools that are have open campuses um, so kids can come and go they do come and go throughout the school day it, it's just not the uh, arrival and departure times I don't I don't know that the entire population is kind of thinks about that they think about school zones and morning and, and and afternoon, but in the high schools, it's really important that that those speed limits be observed throughout the school day. 
Well, I think on the day that we had the, when we did the walk in the, of the path of where that student was, was killed, the school traffic lights were not even functioning. And that's because the school district didn't communicate with the city that school had been extended. I think the city was going by one calendar, but because of weather, the school activities, you know, the school was extended, but nobody communicated that. So we did a walk on the, one of the last day of schools and, and the school signs weren't flashing. There was nothing going on. So there needs to be, you know, better communication with, with all, all parties that are involved. So, I, you know, I think there's some immediate actions that we can do. I think in our planning sessions, we need to just keep working toward that goal. Uh, you know, traffic calming is a big thing in our city. That's what we hear more than that. I hear more complaints about speeding than any other issue. So I don't think we're going to figure it out in the next four minutes, but we're not meant to. This is just meant to be able to lay the first iteration of ideas on the table. Um, and I definitely hear you on speeding, Council Member Westergaard. Um, that's why it is a whole half of the safe system approach framework, those kinetic energy forces and setting speed. So appreciate those comments. And it is going to take a lot to, to make these changes. So we will help guide that. But we want to make sure that it's rooted in the um, and that the ideas are generated, and then we follow through with the guidance that is necessary. There, so. Well, <coughs> I mean, one, one of the things, I, I think we've identified some pieces of this already, but one of the things we lack is sort of some of the time frame and action plan for achieving it. Um, you know, I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone up here. I, I've been pushing for us to fill our priority one sidewalk gap, for example, quicker. Um, because, you know, we want to make it so that people can walk safely, walk safely to school or to transit or to services and amenities that, that they use. Um, and we have, we have this priority one identified, but we have no goal for when we're going to get through our priority one sidewalk. I think the, the same thing, Move DSM has identified pieces of our bike infrastructure and our bike network, and we have no, no goal or time frame for doing it. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we have a tendency to do is we have plans that outline all of the steps that we should take, but we don't take that next step of benchmarking when we want to get these things done by. Um, and some of that is because, I, you know, then we would have to change budgets to, to meet that. But that's a, that's a piece that we should know, and that is part of good decision making. If this is truly a priority, we should identify time frames so that we can put dollar amounts next to that for, for making those investments. Because otherwise, like with our priority one sidewalks, we just sort of arbitrarily picked a three million I mean, partly because maybe that was what staff could accomplish given current staffing levels. And, and then the fight is over, do we maintain that status quo? Do we have a cut of that? And it's not tethered to any sort of broader goal. And so having some of those time frame pieces on, on the infrastructure, um, and that, that goes from priority one sidewalks, bike networks, I, I mean, heck, even our, our paint budget. We don't even have, like, a, I think, an adequate paint budget. Are there things that we can do quickly and with not a lot of dollars? I mean, Grand Avenue is a really good example. My guess is we could have a complete redesign of Grand Avenue with just some paint in some, in some regard. I mean, obviously, I think there are a more comprehensive piece that you could do with, uh, I mean, I suggested roundabouts there earlier but but what are some things that we can do that are actionable and tie that to what do we need to do from a budget making perspective 
like that type of data I, and planning, I think, would be really helpful to move our discussion to the next level. Yeah, and interim actions, I think, are really important in this. Um, I think too often we put in temporary solutions as a permanent answer. So, but I think interim actions under a larger action and then those interim progress reporting towards um, a larger action um, will be important. So, so Josh touched on a, a topic about a, a continental striping, which um, in some cities that's, that is the way crosswalks are marked. And um, that's not in our current policy. We just have the two parallel lines. I don't, I don't know what the, um, that's sort of, we do the minimum and it, it would be great to learn from other cities about how they do Continental's striping and how they move to that. And, and also what that does for um, alerting the drivers to, um, pedestrians. Uh, so in Des Moines, crossing the street, I have a sense that um, I, uh, dr drivers don't uh, p pay attention to pedestrians crossing the street unless they're in front of their grill. I know in St. Paul they actually have um, traps that they catch people, um, ticket drivers for for, for someone who stepped off the curb and um, and and not stopped for that person, so I think we can do much better uh, for how um, it's going to take a lot larger paint budget, but um, I think that's important. I'm um, smiling because the um, I walk most communities when I come visit. Um, and that's very telling. I walked from my hotel where I'm staying to city council this morning and noticed a few things. High visibility crosswalks are an example that I always use for the example of the safe system framework of increasing attentiveness and awareness. But the second thing that um, tells me a lot about um, safety culture in a community is actually my Uber ride into a city. Um, when I tell the Uber driver what I do for a living, I get an earful of ideas and challenges. And I, I had a mini, mini meeting last night with my Uber driver about exactly what we were talking about um, today. And I like wasn't saying, hey, I'm here for the Vision Zero effort. It's so funny whenever I say, oh, I'm a transportation planner. Like I hear all sorts of stories from uh, Uber drivers. So it's a pretty telling um, kind of uh, temperature check on a community's um, uh, perceptions of transportation. Well, and related to that, there's something different about the Twin City culture where cycling uh, to work year-round is um, part of their culture, and, and they have more severe winters than we have here. So w what could we or should be doing to encourage more uh, bicycling? So. Any other goals or actions that I want to offer up uh, again to those on the phone, especially the mayor? Don't want to forget about those that are on the phone today. Um, so, any goals or actions? I, partly because this is maybe just pressing and has been an ongoing. I would love to see an action plan for that Southwest Ninth corridor and steps that we can do to make that make that safer. Where where do we have crossings? Is a road diet? An appropriate step. I mean, particularly coming out of downtown to say park. That area has just been a hot button area. We've had pedestrian fatalities in that area. We, I, I mean, I just hear a ton from folks there. So personally, that's a that's a place where I'd, I'd like to see that as a starting point to have concrete action for what we can do there uh, to to rally folks behind. I'm sure, sure we're not unusual that there are a lot of schools in uh, uh, transportation corridors. I mean, we have several that are just right against um, I-235. So, so we can use some help. And I think anything that needs to be done needs to be 
between the four wards because, you know, Ward 2 has got some real serious, serious issues. So, you know, as the ward council person, I'm going to be pushing to go there. So it just needs to be equitable for everyone. Yeah, and one example that I'll use talking about schools and, and equity is looking at your land use decision, right? If you have a lot of schools that are located adjacent to interstate or not within walking distance of where people live, looking at your land use policies and what your land use code does or doesn't allow is, is also a step in this. Um, it's not just looking directly at your transportation um, uh, policies, but also how people move, where people move to and from. Um, so looking at changing land use uh, um, codes to encourage more neighborhood schools to not locate schools near highways in the future um, along um, safer roads, not on arterials, for example, looking at those type of, of things the land use patterns have. Well, I know in my ward I've got kids that have to cross state highways to get to school. Yeah. And we need to do something about that. Yeah, and in the safe system approach, we would look at, right, there's a degree at which it is unsafe for someone to cross at grade. No crosswalk, no matter the amount of signal timing and high visibility is going to be safe, sometimes in that condition. So looking at above grade, below grade separation, really, sometimes you do have to make those major investments to make the safest decision. Um, so below grade or above grade crossings sometimes are required if we're choosing to separate uses that require people to cross a road that is unsafe. So I'll cite Boulder again. They're a good example of a major investment has been made. They do a lot of above grade and below grade crossings where crossing at grade is just not safe because they're a very spread out community. Um, and they're a college town too. Um, so they have a lot of people walking to and from UC Boulder's campus. And they've made major investments for above grade and below grade crossings where it is not safe to cross that grade. And if we talk about prioritizing safety, I know that in the um, appropriations bill at, in Congress, there was uh, money put in there for previously red line neighborhoods. And I would think that we would want to look at some of those red line neighborhoods and what have we done, you know, I mean, that was designed to keep people in. And that has made it very challenging uh, for the safety issues in some of our neighborhoods. So I would think we would want to concentrate on some of those red line, previously red line neighborhoods, and and let's let's talk about those. That would be my priority. Okay. Last, I want to make sure we have yep. we have a little bit of time, but um, want to jump to the next question. Any other like yearning, burning, goals or actions. We'll have plenty of time to discuss um, this and, and we'll be drafting initial goals and actions sooner rather than later so that we make sure we get feedback and we can add to the list so that by the time we get to a draft plan, we kind of already have those draft actions finalized. Um, so we'll be kind of documenting those draft actions throughout this listening period as well to make sure we're capturing as many as possible and then making them measurable and fit into one another in the plan. So any other goals or actions? Okay, if not, we'll shift to the last question. So how can the city go about prioritizing safety in all decision-making processes? We've already talked about this a little bit, but what are some policies that you've heard are hindrances to prioritizing safety? What are some guidance documents within the city that you think need updating? What are other plans? I'll pose this another way because I actually haven't heard this from you all. What are other plans that you've developed that you wish you would have done more work on? I know we talked about some, um, some of the um, phase one sidewalks not having a goal year. Um, what are some things you want to make sure we look at in this Vision Zero transportation safety planning process? Um, to make sure we're connecting the dots on all the work that you've done previously or things that you don't think are working. I'll open up this, well, this question a little bit more. I'll answer that. We're not engineers. We're just elected people. I'm going to look to our engineering staff that are out there and help them guide us. They are the experts at it. 
I'm not going to be an armchair engineer, and I don't know what's best. I might have ideas, but I'm going to look to Steve and his team. Yeah, definitely agree with that. And, yeah, um, I mean, I great working with the city staff so I, far, and that's why we think yeah. city staff interviews are very important. We're also a, a step that we're doing in our work right now is a review of policies. Um, practices, guidance documents, things that haven't been updated for 35, 40 years that may need to be looked at um, and set as an action, right? We're not going to make those changes in this planning process, but making sure that we're kind of uncovering as many actions that are needed to get there. So, um, but I will say, so coming from an architecture and planning background, I think that actually getting opinions from non-engineers, sorry, um, is good. We all interact with the built environment all day, every day. I actually love doing planning with children. They're fearless. They don't worry about the obstacles of what's allowed in this policy or what the state law says for this, but they know what built environment should look like. Um, so it's a good kind of temperature check for us as engineers <laughs> and planners on on what we're looking at because a lot of times we get caught up in the numbers or the policies what they do or don't allow us to do so um yeah that's why i wanted to ask this question it's not about a technical answer what's right or wrong but where do you think we should be prioritizing and what things should we be looking at what things have you in another planning process like talked about that had to do with safety that you want us to look at in a plan that is about prioritizing transportation safety. Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll give an example, and this is as much about creating a culture as well. It, it's something that, that's come up, but, uh, and, and this is maybe about prioritizing transportation safety in our permitting department. You know, when we have construction, we don't really do a great job of thinking about how we maintain safe, safe access for folks. So there will be times when sidewalks will be completely blocked um, or, or the bike infrastructure will be completely blocked and there won't even be signage to alternatives. But I know other communities, for example, they'll, they'll create a path or they'll, they'll take a lane of the traffic out and have physical barriers so that folks can, can keep walking. And that's one of those things that if we're not doing that, we're not really prioritizing safety in, in all decision making. It's kind of completely absent and not even being thought about. And if part of our goal is to create a culture of, of, of safety, like that needs to be in, in every department. So our permitting folks need to be thinking about transportation safety as they accommodate things. Um, and, uh, and then the, the other piece is, um, I really want, <laughs> like, this is ultimately gonna be a budget priority discussion too. So how do we start incorporating this into our, our budgeting? Because we can have Vision Zero, but if Vision Zero isn't reflected in in the decisions we make from a budgetary perspective, we're we're never going to get there. Um, and and I think that's one of the challenges that we have. We do a lot of good planning, but we don't connect that to to our budgeting. And and I don't want to make that mistake with this with this plan. So that, that's a really, I think, important piece that maybe we can make fun. So if there's lessons learned from other communities, how they've been able to incorporate the safety part and still put together a budget, it would be, be great to hear how that's worked. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my recommendation is to have a dedicated transportation safety pro uh, budget for <laughs> capital improvements, communications, safety culture efforts. But then really a lot of the decisions like the one that council member Mendelbaum just mentioned or misutilities tearing up the road and not putting it back correctly, like looking at your existing policies and practices and guidance on where those decisions are made because oftentimes you can take existing budget line items like repaving a road and integrate safety into it into in a way that doesn't cost a whole lot more you're just looking at spending the money 
that you have in existing transportation funds differently. Just like right, looking at your land use code, what changes can you make for the future to change the things we know don't work now from how and where people move to and from. So don't forget that like right, there's things that you, you are currently doing and currently funding that we could just be looking at differently and through a different lens, but using the money you have all the same. So it's kind of, it's a two-prong approach. I think you should have dedicated safety funds for those capital improvements, those systemic changes, um, but then looking at how you're spending those dollars that you currently have towards safety. Related to safety, um, uh, a new office building recently opened in downtown Des Moines, and there was uh, no shower accommodations for bike commuters. That's what other cities are doing to encourage people to bike commute. So, you know, I don't know if there's, so that's more like approving the, the design of a, but, uh, of a building. Are they checking the box? I don't know exactly how that works in other cities, but I know that m many, um, office buildings make accommodations for cyclists that, that they have a place to shower. So that's, so that's a missed opportunity. And, and maybe one of the questions we start asking, and this is an opportunity to incorporate that, again, connecting another decision-making process. Right. There's no reason, particularly if the city is contributing either through abatement or TIF with some of these projects, that right. that's, at least part of a conversation with with the developer in advance. Yeah, um, you can certainly look at your building code requirements if you follow the international building code with supplements. Um, you can, that's certainly something that you can explore. Um, that would be an action in the action plan. Again, we wouldn't make that change during this project period, but um, uh, it could be an action or a goal of wanting to encourage more walking and biking in Des Moines and making sure that walking and biking is safe in Des Moines. That would be the goal. And then the action could be things like um, changing the building code um, in the city of Des Moines to encourage um, whatever code that falls under. I know that under the LEED um, uh, building program, uh, developers get credit if they want to go for lead certification of their building they get credit for showers for people choosing to commute by active transportation so i would encourage things like that to always be incentives versus regulation um but it's all interconnected right we just talked about encouraging active transportation through safety and then it improves sustainability of buildings all throughout so um yeah it's all interconnected Uh, Mayor, if you're there, would love to have your your feedback too. Um, while well, I'm here, uh, been listening and uh, been uh, active in planning, as you all know. Uh, prior to being on the council, it's uh, interesting to uh, get this uh, new thought process and, and feedback and. Um, while I don't have any specific ideas right now, I would uh, um, look forward to um, sitting down with um, these folks as they this process and plan progresses. Uh, and uh, thank council for the input this morning. I think it's important stuff. Thanks. Mayor. Council Member Voss, I think you had yep. another comment. No. Uh, uh, no, I was going to ask, I know there's a public meeting today, well, there's a Transportation Safety Committee meeting shortly, and then there's a public meeting. Could you remind me of the time and location for that public meeting? Yeah, so I will actually give Chris Shires a chance um, uh, to answer a question. Um, so it's not just me, but it's at the Central Library. Um, at 2.30, I believe, right? I get my time zones mixed up. I'll let Chris answer, because he's leading the local on-the-ground engagement since 
I'm based in Silver Spring. Chris is here in Des Moines. So yeah. Sarah, Sarah thank you. So Chris Shires with Confluence Locally. Uh, it is at uh, 1.30 uh, till uh, 4.30. I had, I was not ready to answer that question, so I had to look at our calendar because we have a very busy day today. 1.30 to uh, 3 p.m. today at the Central Library. Uh, we will have four engagement stations, so it's really show up when you want, uh, participate with us. We'll be there to assist, but four different stations for us to hear uh, our community members' uh, stories on transportation, safety, and safety-related issues and concerns they have for us. And so. And can you tell me what you did to get that message out? Because I don't think people even know about it. If you're the consultant, right. what did Confluence do to get that message out? Yeah, and so uh, there are flyers posted, and then there are social media posts by the city. And so this is just kind of the first little kickoff to start building some awareness. Where are flyers posted? Uh, they're at the library currently. So it, it do, did not have a huge outreach. There was not a huge outreach reach push on this. This is just kind of a preliminary to take advantage of the fact that Sarah's in town today. Uh, so really kind of a little bit of a preliminary meeting. So really the next big things we'll be doing are a series of pop-up events to get the word out about our big four listening sessions that we want to do one for every ward. And so we'll be reaching out to each of the ward council members <coughs> to see what your schedule and availability, if you wish to, to be involved, uh, would be uh, maybe an appropriate location. Is it a community center or a school building uh, within the ward that's convenient uh, for folks and that would all be in September so we're kind of early in the process but in September will really be those big meetings as well as there's that online component uh, so folks can participate online uh, as well at those individual ward meetings but, but let's gauge I'd like to know how many people show up today because I don't think anybody knows about it yeah and I, it seems to me like it's kind of a waste of time and taxpayer dollars to have a meeting that nobody knows about. Yeah, I absolutely appreciate that. And this is a little more of taking an opportunity and advantage. We're in town, so it's super easy for us to staff and do there. It's a but, good test, room, uh, test run uh, for our engagement activities. And it was really to just kind of fill Sarah's full day up since she traveled in for these meetings. So we're just filling time. We're not really reaching out. I, I guess I just, I just, I just disagree with that. I just don't understand. Yeah. We've got a member in the public. Did you know anything about it? Um, I, mean, I saw it on Facebook. It's only been on Facebook for three days, and when I saw it, I, I just had to okay. across it. There wasn't Let, a news release that well, was. Let's do better. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. do better. Yeah, and absolutely. We will certainly absolutely. work with city staff to do so. Um, yeah, and uh, Chris mentioned there's going to be four stations. We'll be using these stations throughout the engagement um, at the pop-up events, at the um, at the community workshops, which will be in each ward. Um, so this is not the first or only chance. We also um, uh, will be communicating to everyone that stops by today that the bulk of the, the majority of the engagement, really collecting and listening, will be the pop-up events and workshops. Um, we just settled on the mid-September date, so we'll be making sure that that is a leave behind and a takeaway for community members that stop by. Um, but I'll give it a plug now for those that are watching on the YouTube um, yeah. live to please stop and visit us um, uh, between 1.30 and 3 o'clock local time um, at the Central Library um, to stop by and give us your thoughts and ideas on transportation safety. Thank you. So with that, I feel like that was a good closing, but are there any other thoughts or ideas that you wanted to make sure that we receive today? And we'll, of course, have many follow-ups and are looking forward to having many deeper conversations about this as we develop the plan for Des Moines. Any closing thoughts? I mean, I think this was a, a great conversation, and I think the prompts were really helpful to, to get us talking. And, uh, I know, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I think this is a, a high priority for several of us on the council, and it's incredibly important work and will be impactful on the community. So we're, we're eager to see how this process plays out and what, what we can work together on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate the council setting aside time for this important topic. Yep. Thank you. Thanks.
Are we adjourned? Let's go. We're adjourned.